OK, so I'm Peter, and I have built a fast compiler in Dart. Um, it's based on the kernel and the parser and scanner from Dart to JS. Um, so um, I'll be talking about this compiler today. But uh, first, I'm going to give you like a very, very brief introduction to what is a compiler. Then I'll discuss how we did implement compilers. Uh, and uh, then my uh, then I will philosophize over whether or what it is that makes them slow. Um, and then uh, try to use those ideas to uh, come up with designs for a fast compiler. And then even uh, at the end, I'll go into some implementation details of, uh, of this new compiler. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of what a compiler really is. I just uh, I want to call out this uh, specific T diagram here. Uh, I'm taking that from the Dragon Book, um, which is a popular uh, textbook for computer science. Or it used to be. I don't know if it's used anymore. But basically, the idea is that we have a source language that's the input to the compiler, and the compiler then spits out something in a target language. And the compiler is also implemented in some kind of language. And uh, there's a tendency to uh, get confused when the input language and the impl uh, sorry the source language and the implementation language is the same, um, and it's not really a problem. Um, what what you, you just make sure that you keep uh, an old version of your compiler from the previous release so you can compile the the new compiler. Uh, you just want to make sure that you don't use. <coughs> the newest features in your compiler so it can be compiled with the with the old version or um, you have to keep them sort of updated all the time but that's uh that's the only point i wanted to make about compilers so uh, let's talk about how we implement the compilers uh so i'm i'm going to be uh, i'm going to mostly be looking at uh, dart to js as an ex as an example because it's dart to js that i know um you might uh, argue that they are um, well. We have we certainly have had other compilers on on, on on the team, but this is the one I know, right? Uh, and uh, Dart to JS is kind of almost like a textbook compiler. is separated into a, a number of phases, and uh, those phases you can recognize from from some textbooks. Um, so there's a lexer phase and a parser phase. There's some resolution going on. There's type inference. And then the build an SSA graph, which is also textbook. And then you optimize the SSA. And eventually, once you're done uh, optimizing, then you emit the code. Um, or in, in Dart2JS case, it, it uh, transforms the SSA to JavaScript, which then gets emitted. Um, so the compiler I have built is not optimizing. So um, if we're looking at the left-hand side of this diagram, the black box, uh, that corresponds to Dart to JS when it's uh, run with the analyze only flag. That's a fair comparison uh, to a new compiler. Uh, at least it's fair to Dart to JS. Um, it may not be uh, fair to a new optimizing compiler, but since my compiler isn't optimizing, I'm happy to be compared to this. So um, I mentioned resolution uh, briefly before. So what I mean by resolution is figuring out what does identifiers mean. And um, in Dart to JS, we specifically mean resolving the leftmost identifiers in an expression. Uh, those are the ones that I have marked with boldface or put a little gray arrow under. Uh, and then uh, there's another kind of resolution, which is, um, from my understanding of the way the analyzer talks about resolution, is they are often talking about this as well when they're talking about resolution. Um, I'm calling that non-local resolution. Uh, so just so we are clear on the concepts here. So we remember from the previous slide here that um, if we look at the analyzed only part of Dart to JS. There are six phases here. And uh, these six phases start with the scanner. And uh, if I measure how far, how, how long time the scanner is running, I get, uh, so I, again, okay, so I can take Dart to JS as a program. It's a Dart program. Then I can pass it to itself, right? It's a big program, so it's a good benchmark. So when Dart to JS is passing, 
itself or scanning itself in this in this case it takes a quarter of a second 250 milliseconds uh, so if we know that it takes 250 milliseconds to uh, analyze or to scan dart to js and we have five more phases well what would be a sort of like estimate of what the total runtime should be well um, well, we can say the worst case, each of these phases should, they should definitely not be taking longer time than the scanner, right? Because the scanner has to look at in bytes uh, or a number of bytes and, uh, the, uh, and then it transforms them into a number of tokens. And the number of tokens is strictly less than the number of input characters. I'm saying maybe the number of tokens is like 10% of the number of characters. So based on that, uh, you can do a simple calculation saying that uh, the compile time or the an analysis time here for Dart to JS analyzing itself should be between uh, uh, somewhere between 400 milliseconds and um, uh, and one and a half second. Um, uh, and I also want to point out that this back of the envelope uh, calculation here is is is, is not actually crazy. Um, these were the numbers I saw when I profiled Java C when I worked on, on, on Java C. I, I could literally, literally split up the faces like this and I could see that the, the scanner was the slowest part and the rest of the faces were, were much faster compared to the scanner. Uh, but, I mean, somewhere between 400 and uh, uh, or half a second uh, and, a, and, and a second and a half is not actually what's happening. Uh, so Dart to JS takes six to seven seconds for uh, for scanning it or for uh, analyzing itself. And you can see if we look at the, each of the individual faces, um, uh, uh, not really any of uh, some of the faces are sort of like on par or a little bit faster than the scanner, but. I mean, it completely blows out when you get to uh, local resolution. Even the parser is much slower. And again, the parser has to look at 10% the amount of input than the scanner. So what's going on here? Something, something is wrong here. And uh, this has been annoying me for a long, long time because I knew from Java C these are, the numbers should not look like this. Um, so uh, finally got a chance to try uh, from new and so the new compiler I've been building is at uh, 3.2 seconds at, at this time. Those 3.2 seconds also includes writing out uh, a serialized uh, file where start to JS analysis doesn't. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, again, if we do this calculation from before, the numbers aren't adding up. But I'm still pre pretty happy that it's twice as fast as uh, Dart to JS is. Uh, I also put in the numbers for Dart K, which is the analyzer based. Uh, Dart to kernel compiler. So, what is it that makes them slow? Well, I have a whole bunch of possible ideas for what is it that makes uh, uh, our compiler slow, um, and so I'm uh, I'm, I'm just going to go through them uh, one by one. So, uh, uh, a, a possible uh, candidate is uh, is garbage collection. So. Um, if you run uh, the Dart VM with uh, with dash dash verbose dash GC, um, it will print out uh, the number of garbage collections it's doing. And uh, when it's printing out garbage collections, it's also printing out how long each garbage collection takes. And with a little bit of uh, uh, magic, uh, you can import that into a spreadsheet and and uh, and uh, <coughs> add them all together. And if I do that for Dart to JS analyze only, uh, it's like uh, more than a second is spent in the garbage collector. Uh, my new compiler is spending uh, less than half a second there, right? So we get a difference by for almost a second. So definitely, uh, some time is being lost in the garbage collector. So the garbage collector is definitely a problem for Dart to JS. There's, there's no doubt about that. I have no idea whether or not our the, the Dart VM's implementation of a garbage collector is efficient. I don't know anything about that. It kind of doesn't matter because I don't think it would be like 10 times as slow as it should be, right? Uh, so may, may, maybe it could be like 10% faster. I don't know. 
it, these numbers still wouldn't uh, change that much. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, another thing is, uh, is visitor overhead. Um, so a visitor is a, is a common pattern we use in compilers that's convenient for, uh, for traversing AST nodes. And um, if you're not careful with visitors, I, I know that from some, uh, some changes I made to Dart C, uh, which was the first Dart compiler that we had that was compiling Dart to JavaScript. It was written in Java. So you have input language Dart, output language JavaScript, implementation language is uh, Java. Uh, we, had, uh, we had some simple transformation on, 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 on code to remove blocks or always ensure that there were blocks on, on control statements and other ones to remove parenthesized expressions. And it's like, there were like five simple visitors like that with a very simple and focused ta task, each of them. And I was looking at them and, and they were taking up a long time. And then I compared that to my, it was like, I, I could see them sort of like each of these visitors next to the other phases in the compiler. So I fused these together. And by that reduced the combined time of these uh, five visitors to a fifth, right? So th there can definitely be some overhead just in the visitors. Uh, and so depending on the complexity, I say generally here, most visitors are dominated by the time it takes to traverse the tree well, it, it really depends on what you're implementing in them, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, so another thing is non-locality of data. Um, so this has to do with how you access memory. Uh, if you're accessing memory in a, in a sequential form, um, the, uh, the CPU, uh, you will read memory uh, more efficient because you, uh, you're reading sequential uh, data from, from memory uh, and stuff is kept in, uh, in the local cache uh, before it has to fit the next page. Uh, whereas if you just like you go random around, uh, you will get a lot more uh, page faults when, when, you are, when you're reading data. Um, and uh, things like visitors can contribute to this or uh, Separating your program into various phases can probably also uh, 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 contribute to this. I haven't done any particular measurements for this. I'm just saying this is a possible thing that could be going on. Uh, again, uh, are there too many abstractions in Dart to JS? I don't know. It could be. Um, there's definitely a, a big difference between these numbers. On the other hand, Dart to JS has SSA graphs and uh, JS nodes, right? Uh, so, and, uh, uh, and, and so may, may, maybe what I'm doing is I'm just getting rid of, like, uh, I, I only have one node hierarchy. Eric, you had a, a question. I was basically that, that JS doesn't want to be compiler. Yeah. So even though you're running it for that piece. Yeah. Yeah, because this, this number is really not, it's not, it's not a fair comparison. Because uh, my compiler is emitting stuff, but it's not optimizing. Uh, and the numbers I have been comparing are not really the numbers represented by these. So yeah, it, it's, I'm just saying something to watch out for. Um, so uh, let me just briefly mention what polymorphism is. I think most of you guys know what it is. You have a dynamic call. Uh, and uh, so you have uh, an object O and you're calling a method M on that. If uh, O is always of, of the same runtime type, we call it monomorphic. If there can be multiple types, uh, we call it polymorphic. And uh, if there can be a lot of type, we call sometimes called that m megamorphic. I believe that that VM only set, uh, distinguishes between monomorphic and polymorphic, if, if there's even a distinction there. Uh, the reason why we're interested in knowing about uh, monomorphic versus polymorphic calls is that um, if we know a call is monomorphic, it can be inlined. And that, that, that is the precondition for all other optimizations that will be going on. So again, the compiler I have written is not optimizing. So this is for understanding why my compiler is running fast or slow 
it is not for understanding and implementation detail of my compiler. Uh, does the Dart VM generate suboptimal codes? That's something people like, they always like to blame their compiler or the runtime or whatever. Um, I think we have some evidence that maybe the polymorphic handling of code in, in the Dart VM could be done better. But the thing is, as long as you have polymorphic code, it's not going to be fast. So I don't really think it's, it, it's the VM uh, we, uh, necessarily to blame for this particular thing. It is like, as a programmer, I believe you need to be aware of this. Um, I just want to point out that um, uh, if you are concerned about polymorphisms, uh, polymorphism in your code, then uh, there's a common pattern in visitors you need to, to watch out for is this where you introduce a new visit method uh, instead of saying node.accept. Um, this place will always be polymorphic. And as far as I understand for how the VM tracks types, um, even if this call gets inlined, um, it's still tracking the type for, for, uh, for the original place. There's only one place it's being tracked, so it, it will be polymorphic even if it's inlined, as far as I understand. Uh, so uh, that's the thing to watch out for if you're if you see a visitor is up there in the in your profile. So okay, so I've sort of gone through a bunch of hypotheses, and uh, I, I haven't necessarily proven them, but I had all these ideas, so I sort of came up with a with a few things to uh, to try to. Uh, uh, to keep in mind when when uh, when building this new compiler, right? So one of them is to avoid generating garbage, or at least uh, make sure that the garbage you generate can be collected immediately, uh, because uh, just uh, updating the young space is faster than doing a full garbage collection. Try to avoid many faces uh, or visitors. Um, so uh, avoid unneeded abstractions is also a design principle I've been following. Um, it doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, you need to have abstractions, right? So, uh, and, 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 and all I'm saying here is that there's some things where I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm, I may have noticed some problems in, in some other places. And so now I'm trying to go, a, pull a little bit more in a different direction. This is not like, uh, concrete things you have to do. Um, avoid highly polymorphic code. I think that's always important if you're looking for performance, uh, but it can be really tricky to get rid of it. Um, yeah, I, I just want to make a meta point about, uh, so uh, yeah, the VM should be able to do better. Clearly it should, but um, uh, that's not going to solve your immediate problem. So you need to, uh, uh, you need to work around it. Uh, and, and it may also be that your particular use case is not uh, the most typical customer that the VM has and probably be in everyone's interest that they focus on our paying customers rather than uh, uh, our internal tools that possibly could be rewritten at a slight disadvantage to, to me or whoever it is. So now with all that, uh, sort of hopefully set the states for the implementation uh, of, of, uh, of the new compiler. So um, this is sort of like a, 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 a quick overview of, uh, of what the compiler does. So uh, it scans a file uh, and then it builds an outline of the file. And once it's done building that outline, it, uh, it, it, it uh, releases the token. So they're, they're not uh, stressing the garbage collector. Um, and uh, the... Uh, and then as it has uh, built up this outline, you can see, oh, there was a part file, there was an import or an export, so more files are added, and then it iterates there in, in the beginning. And then once all uh, files have been read and built outline for them, they are combined into libraries. So if a file is a part, it's uh, merged into a library, and, uh, and then we get to a point where the compiler has been running for uh, 800 milliseconds. And uh, so, uh, any serialization format you uh, you come up with should be faster than 800 milliseconds. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's just a waste of time. And you would you just as well read the source directly. 
so uh, it's good to to uh, to know stuff like that. But I think uh, kernel is uh, it's pretty well below that. Um, so yeah, uh, and then uh, there's a bunch of other phases in uh, in the compiler for. Well, I, I just want to mention this thing about computing library scopes. Uh, once uh, when I implemented that, I, I was in for a big surprise. I, I did not expect that to be ten times as fast as as the implementation in Dart to JS, but it but it was. Uh, so another thing here is I, I detect cyclic hierarchies in eight milliseconds. That's all I, something it seems to be costly normally, but it, doing it this way is where uh, I, I just have the entire graph and do one computation on it just seems to be faster. Uh, I think it has to do with some locality as well. Maybe uh, the code gets exercised enough that the VM uh, optimizes it while it's still running. I don't know what's going on, but uh, so eventually we have like a complete outline of um, of the program, and an outline is basically uh, like an AST tree for the entire program without any method bodies and initializers. And then I start uh, building method bodies for those. Um, and eventually transform mix in applications. And we can see here that uh, building the method bodies is less than twice as slow as the Dart2JS parser, right? And the parser has additional phases that it's doing it. So something is definitely working here. Um, uh, yeah, I think I uh, explained most of this. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, the, uh, so I'm building this outline, which is an AST tree. Uh, so the AST uh, tree is the kernel AST, the IR format. And uh, kernel doesn't have any um, uh, dictionaries for looking up members. It doesn't uh, implement any scopes. So instead, I'm decorating those things. Uh, so I, for each library, I have a library builder. For each class, I have a class builder. For each uh, procedure, I have a procedure builder. And those have uh, the list of, of they, they have the, the dictionaries <clears throat> that you need to look up stuff. Uh, it's just because I figured uh, I, I, don't, I don't need to check whether or not scanning linearly through uh, a whole bunch of things uh, in order to look, look up stuff in scope. I had an expectation that having a map available uh, would be fast. <clears throat> so I, I, I did the, this initially. Uh, so the builders can be generated from Dart sources or from uh, DIL files. A DIL file is a, is a kernel binary file. Um, yep. And uh, this allows me to, uh, 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 this will, this, this can form a basis for separate compilation. Um, and uh, the builders can be used to generate the Dart Analyzer ASTs or kernel ASTs. So here's a, here's a detail uh, from the implementation. Uh, in the slides, there's a link to the actual source code right there. And um, as you can see, it, it, this matches very well what I was, uh, what I was mentioning before. Uh, you can see each of the individual things it's doing. So these are like global operations on the entire outline. Uh, so first build up the entire graph of the outline and then uh, resolve the parts. That means uh, each of the files that we have that turns out to be a part gets shoved into a library and somebody compl uh, and you complain if there are parts that have a part or whatever. Um, then I compute the library scopes, also a global operation. Um, resolve all the types in the signatures now that I have the scopes. I think the reason why this is uh, relatively fast is that rather than doing what dart to js will normally do is say, okay, I need to figure out what is the signature of this function and then go in and set up the scope for that function, throw away the scope uh, or compute the signature and then throw away the scope what I do is that I create a library scope and then I uh, uh, resolve all the types in that library. I create a scope for a class, resolve all the types inside that class, or 
in, in the signatures. Um, yes. And uh, <clears throat> so um, the way I build up this stuff is by using the parser uh, from Dart to JS. And the parser from Dart to JS, in case you're not familiar with it, is uh, unlike uh, most parsers you're familiar with, where um, so it's a recursive descent parser. You're probably familiar with the concept of recursive descent parsers. Uh, you have a method called pass identifier. Yeah. Oh, for example, yeah. You have a method called pass identifier. Normally, it would be returning an AST node that represents an identifier. The way I wrote it was um, I wanted to have the tokens in a register. The next token, I always wanted to keep that in a register. So if I pass that in as the first argument to each method and always return it, I figured there was going to be a big chance that the underlying representation would put it in a register. So that's that's why I wrote it like this. So now I have taken up the return value, so I had to come up with something else. So I added a listener. So, so I tell the listener, oh, there's an identifier. Or maybe that's not. Uh, but in, in case there is an identifier, I, I tell the listener, there's an identifier. Here's the token. The token has the string that represents that identifier. That That's all the... Uh, so it's the listener's job uh, to keep track of the uh, the stack of AST nodes you're building up. It can also do error recovery here. You can see, oh, I expect an identifier. I can look at that token and maybe say, oh, this is a keyword. Let me let me just pretend it was an identifier. I'm going to report an error on this, but let's just pretend everything worked. And uh, so, yeah. So how do we build the method bodies? Well, uh, I had thrown away the token from before, so I actually passed the file again. Then I, uh, so sorry, I scanned the file again. Um, then I passed the file uh, using uh, something I call diet passing, where basically I, I skip types and expressions. And whenever I, I, I get to a declaration, I look up the corresponding declaration in the outline, and then I know, okay, so now I have the, I can find the corresponding builder so now I have a procedure builder, and then I create an instance of a different kind of listener that for the uh, for building up kernel ASTs, I call body builder because it builds the bodies, and I like puns. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, and then it's the body builder's responsibility to build up the, uh, the kernel AST graph. Um, yeah, and, and so the key thing about this bodybuilder is that it it, um, it generates a fully resolved program, um, uh, AST node. So once you're done, uh, the method you get back, uh, you know what everything is pointing to, and you can directly start generating code based on this. Um, with one caveat, I haven't implemented strong mode yet, so it's only what I call local resolution, not the non-local resolution yet. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to give this talk was so that uh, uh, people working on strong mode could uh, help me think about ways to do this. And so uh, we have already been been talking about that. And and, and uh, it's very early, but uh, we, we are optimistic that it should we should be able to extend this uh, approach to strong mode as well. So on the scan file again, pass file again. It's completely obvious that there's something going on there that might be duplication of what you have already done, right? Or is it just a matter to fix that and get lots of strings or yeah. as position? Uh, uh, so, um, uh, well, uh, I haven't measured whether or not this is an optimization or not. Mm. Um, the, the, the problem is that uh, I'm worried about creating intermediate objects that I don't want to use. Uh, so uh, that's part of it. But I mean, it shouldn't take off that much to say, okay, uh, record the offset of a particular method. Um, but um, um, I think it makes sense when you look at this uh, for modular compilation. It makes a lot of sense because 
in that case, you first want to build the outline, write out the outline to disk, and then have a number of parallel processes read the outline. And those will then have to read in the files again anyways. So, so that's why um, I'm saying it mostly makes sense for modular compilation, but it's an optimization. I haven't tested that yet, but it's definitely, uh, I mean, it's okay for now, right? Uh, uh, but um, right now, I'm comfortable with the performance of the compiler. I just want to keep it there, and uh, and then we'll hopefully we'll have more time to uh, to look into more optimizations. Another point some people have been making about this uh, particular thing is that uh, for the special use case that's hot reloading or uh, incremental compilation or whatever, um, it may make sense in that particular case uh, to sort of like have a model where you push all the way through, right? You scan. You have the outline of the existing pro uh, program, then you scan to produce a new outline of the change parts, and then you immediately generate uh, a, a kernel for those. Uh, so, so we'll definitely have to look into more whether or not this is an optimization or not, and, and if it is in all cases. Uh, it's just to remind you about resolution, right? Uh, so the resolution part I have implemented is the, the bold stuff uh, the black arrows uh, would require uh, more type information. And that type information isn't generally available in data as I know it, but in strong mode, it, it should be there, I think. Um, so that's why it's tied to, to strong mode, implementing that part. Well, and, and also, uh, it, it's not really interesting without strong mode because strong mode gives guarantees about this. Um, if you don't have strong mode, you, they are all dynamic calls unless you have done some type inference on them. Okay, so uh, you remember hopefully uh, the pass identifier from earlier. So um, here is the corresponding implementation of handle identifier. We see here how I. Um, I recognize, basically I say, okay, this identifier is the first identifier in an expression. So is this one, because uh, this is an exp I don't have a good name for these expressions because I mean, the entire thing here is also an expression, right? But X dot first is a sub, exp I don't know. It's a sub expression, of course, but that's not entirely precise either. Maybe Leslie can help me come up with a, Oh, okay. You don't have a word for this. Okay. Um, well, anyways, I, so the parser can, uh, uh, I can always tell when, when this is the case from, from basically by adding a little bit of more events to the parser. And so I can, I can tell well or not when I, I see an identifier, if it's the first one, the leftmost in an expression, or if it's not, if it's, and if it's the first one, well, then I, uh, I, I, I find the correct scope and then I look up the name in that scope. And then I have a helper method to uh, to figure out what to do about that uh, builder. Um, otherwise, uh, I just create an identifier. Uh, and you also see I have a push method here. That's because I have a, a, an internal stack in the listener. So that's where I push the result of uh, the identifier. Uh, there's a little bit more detail here. Uh, so I think this kind of explains how resolution during passing uh, takes place. And so there's, there's one more uh, thing that's complicated with uh, resolution, that's label resolution. And uh, basically, again, the parser always knows when it's starting a loop construct, so I have an event, and in that event, I call enter loop. And then uh, I look on the stack, uh, did I push uh, a labeled state statement on the, on the stack? Because uh, if you have a for loop that uh, has a label in front of it, the default thing you break to is kind of that label. Well, that's how it is in kernel anyways. So therefore, I need to make sure that I don't set, set up two different targets here. So therefore, I, I have this uh, check, but that's it. Uh, and, and, and the thing is like, I'm collapsing all the faces. Uh, I'm, I'm, so stuff is supposed to be more complicated, but this feels, it felt so simple to me this once I, I, I figured it out. This is, uh, here's, uh, here's uh, how the, the do while statement is implemented. 
And this is the actual implementation from the bodybuilder. Uh, it's uh, the last slide, so I felt I could reduce the font a little bit. Um, but basically what you see here is that there's a, so when the parser is done parsing a do while statement, it's the one where you have the condition, you first have the body and then the condition, right? The condition will be the first thing on, on the stack, the topmost thing. So I pop that. Um, I use a thing where I say pop for value because I put stuff on the stack sometimes that, um, so in order to deal with plus plus, is, is it context where I care about the value or not? Um, you can, uh, uh, you can simplify the code sometimes, by, uh, or you can, uh, you can generate more pretty code if you can distinguish between uh, if plus plus is uh, well, more efficient code, whatever. This is a, a thing I, I knew from Dartino and we're using in, in a bunch of other compilers, basically. Uh, but there it's like, we, it's a visit call where we say visit for value. Here I say I pop for value. So the thing I pushed on the stack has to be an intermediate object that can be turned into an expression. So I am keeping intermediate objects around, right? Uh, pop statement. Uh, and then uh, I exit the continue target that uh, it pushed the previous uh, continue target on the stack. Uh, so now it takes the current, the current uh, continue target and returns that and restores the previous one, right? The same for the exit target. And then I can see if anybody used it. And if anybody used it, I need to introduce a new label statement. Um, and the reason why I have to introduce a label statement is because label statement doesn't actually itself introduce a label statement. It just throws away its label. Um, because it's only if it's used inside a, a, a loop construct like here. And, and so, yeah. So yeah, um, my conclusion is that it's definitely possible to build a fast compiler in Dart. Um, fusing phases may uh, counterintuitively actually sometimes also make the code easier to understand. So I end up having one big file where I have all the stuff related to how I look up stuff, uh, how, I, how I build up various stuff. It's not separated into multiple phases. Um, that's sometimes simpler. Uh, I, I don't know long term how hard it's going to be to maintain. We'll see. Um, so what's currently missing? Uh, well, uh, not all tests are passing yet. Um, and as I mentioned, strong mode needs to be implemented. And I have put a link to uh, the uh, branch where I'm currently land landing this compiler in the SDK. Uh, the compiler itself hasn't landed, but <clears throat> You have a link to it um, from previous emails in the Git on Borg repository. Yeah, so now I'm ready for questions. If you have any. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's interesting that you have this uh, back of the envelope conclusion at the beginning that this is how fast it should be. Uh, as far as I could see, you made the assumption that an algorithm or a compiler cannot be more than linear, it just has to be at most linear because otherwise you will blow up that computation. And you need to make sure that you don't visit for each phase, you don't visit any nodes more than once. The, the, the last part is, is really cool, it's just like zero copy network stacks and stuff like that. You just avoid piling stuff on top of each other that ends up being linear. But the linear algorithms, I'm, I'm going to hit something that's more than linear somewhere. Yeah, so I'm just going to briefly uh, repeat uh, the question for uh, for the recording. Is uh, so basically Eric is asking, so that back of the envelope calculation, uh, aren't you assuming that uh, that the visitors are linear? And uh, yes, that's what I'm assuming, uh, and and that's based on basically what I've been able to implement myself so far on when it comes to the uh, non optimizing compilers, uh, that seems to be the, the case, uh, provided that you have a sufficiently good implementation of scopes. But all algorithms, anything you do needs to be algorithmic. 
That's what I thought you were saying. Um, well, that's what I'm. Uh, uh, that that's that's the the. the that's the environment in, in, in so uh, again the question was uh, I, I said everything has to be uh, uh, linear I, I don't know if I, I said that but the, I am definitely when I'm implementing stuff in a compiler I am trying my best to make sure that uh, it's linear uh, and and um, so I'm mostly working on before you get to the uh, uh, optimization phases. When, once you you hit inference, type inference, for example, as it is in Dart to JS today, that's definitely not not linear. And um, but there's no reason why everything leading up to that shouldn't be linear. Uh, uh, so there are some. Uh, I mean, an example of that is like. Uh, So what, what goes on here when I when I say resolve continues? So what, what happens there is that I, I I do go back and patch up some some things I put in the AST graph already, right? So I mean, strictly speaking, I haven't I haven't proven that this is linear, but most of the time the things you have to do they they end up in practice being linear. Right, and and uh, I, I mean, we have implemented things in in compilers that that uh, that wasn't, and it always is a problem. Like, uh, yeah. So, uh, Bill, um, you mentioned that some of this improvement might be coming from reducing garbage collector pressure, both you know with dropping stuff uh, from the old heap and just reducing the objects. I just know because I worked on the uh, C plus compilers written in C plus plus that. The alternative is to have you know allocation pools and remove some of these objects that you really know are limited to a certain scope from the garbage collection at all. Uh, would that be something that's worth combining, or it's just by keeping stuff? Most of the stuff you know will be on the temporary, uh, short-lived garbage collection, and trying to that you can use the regular garbage collector to get optimal performance. Yeah. So I uh, so I'm going to try repeating the question. So 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 basically, it's it's around the uh, garbage collection, and the common trick you use in garbage collect uh, for dealing with memory usage in compilers implemented in C or C++ is that you allocate uh, temporary data structures um, in in a chunk of memory that that you know you can throw away in one big operation later on, or maybe even reuse if if you like, and would something like that be useful in an object in in a in in a in a managed language? Is is that what you're asking? Yeah. Well, I I I I think it definitely could be useful sometimes, uh, but I also think that uh, I I think it's tricky, and it's uh, it's probably tricky coming up with a good way of using it that uh, that doesn't lead to a whole bunch of other er uh, errors. It, it um, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, so I'm I'm a, I'm an iPhone user, and and my understanding is that uh, their approach to garbage collection is that they can sort of like uh, detect it. The programmers just have to once in a while insert a few things, and then most of the time the system takes care of it. My impression is that my applications are are killed once in a while because they are running out of memory. Uh, so I don't know which what is right here, but uh, I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in precise garbage collection and, and yeah. Uh, Mikkel, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so so you, um, you seem to have done away with all the visitors in your code, is that true? Yeah. And uh, then instead you have, oh, not instead, but you have then these listeners. I guess they are putting more to the calls to the listeners. Yeah, how many listeners do you have and is that yeah. a problem? Um, so, um, yeah, so Megal is, is asserting that I seem to have done away with visitors. That is correct, but I have listeners instead now. Aren't they polymorphic? Uh, yes, uh, they are uh, polymorphic um, to some extent. Um, so, um, when, but they are 
they're polymorphic, they're not megamorphic, right? So I, uh, uh, how many times do I pass a file? How many times do I, how many times do I invoke the same? Uh, uh, so if, if you look at a given token in a file, how many times uh, do I generate an event for that? I think that's most at most two. So for the outline, I'm, I'm generating an event for uh, everything outside method bodies. And then the next time I go around and pass it to figure out, to match up the the file again with the with the, ex the existing outline, I do that again. So so those are two different uh, listeners. So 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 that's a uh, two polymorphism. Uh, two two uh, yeah, that's probably a word for that. Um, uh, Twoifism. I don't know. Stereomorphism. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, and um, then for the method bodies, is it's um, it's uh, monomorphic. Yeah. And to add to that, I'm pretty sure your listeners are there's a single dispatch from the parser to the listener. You don't have visit accept. Yeah. Yes. That that's correct. So um, yeah, yeah. That's another. Uh, so so uh, what Ian is uh, is saying is that. Um, the listeners are different from visitors in that uh, there's a, there's just a single dispatch, polymorphic or monomorphic dispatch. Um, whereas for visitors, um, there's often like uh, there's there's a double dispatch. Yeah. But I also think that there's a difference between uh, the visit call you get the uh, polymorphic in the number of different nodes that enter there, but here you only get in the number of different visitors. Um, well, uh, well, yeah. So what Les is saying is like it's uh, similar that uh, that the visit method um, makes it. Poly I'm, I'm not sure I in entirely agree with that. I think uh, Ian's point was that you get um, you get polymorphism when you call back into the visitor from 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 a given place, um, and then. Uh, the visitor methods themselves may be polymorphic again. Uh, so the accept method, the, the the accept method on any object will be highly polymorphic, right? And so may some of the calls to the accept method uh, 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 be as well, right? So um, so there's a double uh, thing there. And when you then add the visit method, it's actually three calls that are highly polymorphic whereas for the listener um it, it, it's it, it's it's just one or two listeners and it's always the same method it's calling and you could specialize the parser once for each listener i i could do that yeah have it more yeah uh, uh, yeah so the point was I, I could specialize the parser for each listener if i wanted to yeah um any uh, any other questions? Yes, Sigurd. I think you didn't explain as well as you did earlier to me how you made the cycle detection much faster. So the cycle detection that yes, as I understand it, goes for each class and looks all the way up the hierarchy. Yeah. So that's in worst case O of n squared, while you just look at the whole graph and see if there's any cycles. Yeah. So uh, what Sigurd is is saying is that my uh, cycle. Uh, detection graph uh, i've explained that in more details to him and, and that that's correct uh, so and what data js is doing is that for each class it's searching up its hierarchy to see if there's a cycle what i'm doing instead is that i'm taking all the classes and then i'm asking each of them for their direct super classes like interfaces mixins applications and and uh, super classes so now i i have a set of all the classes to begin with i get a new set for something that could be a super type of something or an interface of something, right? Uh, so by doing that one step, I eliminate all the leaf nodes. Then I do it one more time. I just keep iterating there. And each time it uh, delete leaf nodes with this much length from the, from the bottom. And so this becomes a, a, I don't know, maybe O of n log n algorithm. I don't know. Probably at most of the time, uh, O of n algorithm. So I guess that maybe goes back to Eric's question. It's like, uh, 
sometimes you can think of new uh, new ways of uh, of dealing with it. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you.